first for inviting me. <clears throat> when I first saw the invitation to uh, Ted Bradford, my immediate thought was curry. So uh, it was an uh, easy sell. <clears throat> I've explored storytelling for at least 15 years, uh, specifically the relationship between the things we find archaeologically and the meanings that we give those objects through various forms of narrative. New questions constantly beckon. Two that I'd like to address this afternoon are the ethics of using the cultural heritage of past peoples for my own ends, and how do I go about developing a dialogue in an imagined past? <clears throat> so those are my questions. I want to start with ethics, and to do so briefly, and uh, no doubt not to everybody's satisfaction, uh, and perhaps not to mine. Um, I don't want to shortcut the discussion. We should constantly revisit our responsibilities to the people whom we study. But I see my job as that of an archaeologist who has to get on with the business of studying the past and not a philosopher. Uh, so please indulge me in this brief thought experiment. <clears throat> Recall, if you will, what it is you had for dinner last night. If you have no recollection of last night, um, <laughs> see me after class. Uh, but recall your most recent meal. It really doesn't matter. What animal's life did we destroy that we might eat and survive? For the vegetarians and vegans amongst us, we too caused life to be destroyed. The actual plants that went into the preparation of our food and the plants and animals killed incidental to the production and preparation of our food. Destruction of life is integral to the perpetuation of life. All societies, I think, have understood this to be so. Native Americans and animists uh, the world over beg forgiveness or thank animal spirits for their sacrifices that enable people to survive. Uh, the global monotheistic religions have also uh, have means of giving thanks for the lives destroyed to ensure the persistence of their own. And this traditional one, or Burns' ver version of it, is somewhat on the humorous side, but uh, I'm sure all of you have been to a meal somewhere where somebody has insisted that we all hold hands and say grace. In like manner, we survive professionally and economically off of the cultural carcasses of past peoples. We cannot practice our craft without using our conceptions of the past lifeways, ethics, and cultural products of other peoples. Perhaps like animists, we should recognize this predatory or carrion feeding uh, behavior as indispensable to our professional lives and thank our subjects for what they have left us and for, and, uh, for us and apologize for the misrepresentations that inevitably arise at one level or another, probably several, from our own portrayals. Dedications and acknowledgments are suitable places for such recognition, and we should find other means of thanking and apologizing. Perhaps the last sentence in most acknowledgments should be altered. All errors of omission and commission and all misre misrepresentations of the past are my responsibility. To my subjects, I thank you for what you have left me and apologize for any harm that I might unwillingly commit to your reputations and legacy or words to that effect, preferably in a sincere rather than a perfunctory manner. <clears throat> One of the important goals of archaeology, whether informed by anthropology or history, is to understand how past communities viewed their worlds and how those perspectives informed their behavior. I'm sure I'll not start a riot in this room when I say that we can never achieve a complete understanding of how long dead peoples viewed their worlds. I'm sure those people themselves lack the complete understanding or unanimity of understanding. Our best hope, our expectation, is to constantly refine our sense of the people whom we study and what was important to them, to go beyond sympathy and to achieve to some degree empathy. And here I echo you guys a little bit here. Uh, I distinguish between sympathy as shared emotion and empathy sharing that emotion through the experience and understanding of our subject. And that, of course, is extraordinarily difficult. Uh, the contrast, we can uh, use an analogy, is between Edic and Enoch, <clears throat> if you wish. I can sympathize uh, with the, the loss, of, uh, with a bereaved uh, uh, sense of loss, because I, too, have experienced loss. 
But empathy is to understand how that person is experiencing that loss. To achieve empathy, there are many impediments that range between differential preservation to an uncertain linkage between material remains and worldview. Often the connection between what we recognize as data, or more properly, between the archaeological residues from which we extract data, and the kinds of questions relevant to our society is obscure or tenuous. In my work at the Colonial Port Town of uh, Colonial Port Town of Port Tobacco in Charles County, Maryland, the questions were simple enough. And by the way, I've got another site there indicated too for Tuxen Point, which I'm going to switch over to in a moment. Did the 18th century Scottish and English settlers in and around Port Tobacco recognize the relationship between monocropping of tobacco and sedimentation of the creek on which the town was situated? And if so, what did they do about it? Uh, a geographer named Budshock developed this model back in 1945, and you can see Port Tobacco shows up on that map uh, nearly to the head of the creek. In 1800 and 1862, the creek, a lot of it, has filled with sediment, and so the port town is now effectively landlocked. Actually, Gottschalk was pretty good uh, with his estimation, but he was off probably by 30 or 40 years that this creek had actually started filling in with sediment and landlocked Port Tobacco prior to uh, 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 the Revolutionary War. <clears throat> Intensive archaeological research failed to find any recognition of the problem, much less a concern for correcting it. <clears throat> and yet, you can see with this map, this topographic map, the town was down here, uplands over here, and you could see these ravines that got marked with blue arrows. They saw those back then. They could see these sediments hurtling down the hill. Uh, during a tropical storm a few years ago, I saw them hurtling down the hill. There was a gravelly stream bed created where there had not been one before going across somebody's yard. It looked very nice, actually. A nice landscape feature that they would have paid a lot of money for. And here it was provided uh, mostly because of uh, uh, deforestation and cultivation of the hilltop above. <clears throat> As important as this problem is to present-day Marylanders and to people worldwide concerned with the adverse effects of human action on ecosystems, conventional archaeological approaches may be unsuitable for this kind of question. That is, what did these people know and why did they know it and what did they do about it? What happens when a community sees disaster looming on the horizon? What do they do to understand and correct that problem? Do they try to rectify, uh, rectify the problem, or do they adapt to the changes? And you need only look at the newspaper today, and you'll see all this resonating. <clears throat> the approach that I've been working on attempts to circumvent the apparent limitations of data by developing new means for identifying archaeological testable connections, connections that are not obvious, at least not to me. And by the way, this. The playwriting approach I use is, works very nicely for educating public too and uh, setting myself forth as a leader in the community, as an educator. But here I'm just talking about it as a research technique. Playwriting suits my particular interest and skills. Had I any experience in writing poetry or painting pictures or creating computer uh, graphic simulations, I might employ one of those approaches. But I write prose and have been a theater goer since early childhood. This choice, however, has implications for the kinds of problems I look at and the structure of my inquiry, which will be more cerebral than emotive because um, using carefully chosen words rather than symbolically rich images, for instance. I've outlined the process in my contribution to Ruth and Reinhardt's uh, uh, subjects and narratives, which you've heard about earlier, including the development of scene abstracts and characters. I'd like to spend my last few minutes at the podium T uh, taking you through the process and hopefully soliciting your contribution to a scene. So, <clears throat> here's the problem. We have 17th century plantation sites on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, we've got debt refuse forming around buildings. And we also have empty borrow pits that were used for throwing out trash. So two different, and I have images I think that, so here is a large borrow uh, pit filled with oyster shell and all kinds of 17th century material. Okay, that's one form of discord. 
So let's do some computer simul uh, some surface trend analysis around the building number one. Sorry, this is an old picture, but this is the footprint of the building or a schematic of it. And these are trash middens, presumably surface middens that have formed around the building. And if you go to any historic site, at least in the eastern United States, the docent will tell you, oh, people used to just throw their trash out the nearest door or window. Okay? So that's one form of trash disposal. Hauling it off to a pit and dumping it would be another, right? <clears throat> There's no documentation telling us. These could be two different mindsets at work, two different kinds of behavior. We don't know. I've not seen anything in the archival record. So we're going to pl try this using playwriting as an experimental approach. We set the scene. This is, by the way, how I write these. I actually write an abstract, you know, write what you just saw, I write this, and then write character uh, 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 <coughs> biographies, if you will. The year 1660, we'll put it in July, a nice summer day. Uh, place the foreyard of a typical Chesapeake planter's house, and I'll show you what one of those look like. Yard fowl scattered about, a fenced vegetable yard uh, garden <coughs> adjoining. Two individuals present. It makes it easy if I'm just dealing with two individuals, but I could throw in more. You could even do a monologue. Uh, one is the wife of the planter, and the other is a 12-year-old boy, indentured four or five years. <clears throat> this is um, an artist reconstruction of one of these house types not far from the Patuxent Point site that I was working on, and where this whole issue came up for me. There's the foreyard in front. That would be a servant's quarter off to the right in the planter's dwelling. Uh, is the large building. So imagine um, that the action is going to take place in that little foreyard there. <clears throat> we have two characters. The first one is Magdalen Stevens, aged about 40, and a wife of William Stevens, uh, recently joined the Society of Friends. She arrived in Maryland in 1651 uh, with her husband, sons John and William, and three indentured servants, Margaret Allen, William Harden, Daniel Ellsmore and John Mark. The household would, in coming years, decamp to the other side of the bay. They would actually move across the Chesapeake Bay for a variety of reasons, which I can suspect, but in fact don't have good evidence for either. And that's something else uh, to pursue with this uh, approach. Magdalene Stevens is a real person. We have information about her. John Mark, one of the indentured servants that came over, we don't know anything about. So this is essentially a fictional character. <clears throat> Got to pay his way, cost six pounds roughly to get him from somewhere in England to uh, Maryland. So he pays that off through uh, a contract where he works with these folks for five years. Uh, at the end of that service, assuming he survives, and the death rate is really quite remarkable in Maryland right through the 17th century, mostly because of just people trying to acclimate and the various disease vectors and what have you. But if he survives, at the end of his service, he'll get a barrel of corn suit of clothes and some tools. Uh, at the moment of the scene, he may not live to fulfill his contract because the mistress is really pissed off at him. So, this is all the dialogue we're going to have to start with. Um, <clears throat> so Maglin tossing maize kernels to surrounding yard fowl, or uh, she might be throwing them something else, so we'll get back to that in a moment. Uh, turns toward the dwelling door, stops abruptly with pained look, Okay, then you're going to be Magdalene. Learn your line. Rob, you can be John. Uh, memorize your line. Okay, Dan, fire away. Ah! <laughs> Beep and then turns away from the house. Really? Bugger! <laughs> and now we could write that. Now, going back and rewriting this thing, we might want to get bugger out of here and put something else in, especially if we know what an appropriate word would be uh, for that period. I use that uh, simply because it's kind of neutral. <laughs> uh, there's no cultural reference there. OK. And then when it's, there's beat and beat. And if you're not familiar with theater and, and film, beat is that kind of pause for a second. And you can have a beat, a beat and a half, two beats, or whatever. But there's a brief pause. She turns away from the house. You can imagine she's looking really mad. Jack! Jack! Yeah, don't give up your day job. Jack! Okay. <laughs> okay. She bends, picks up a ceramic shot. Clearly, she stepped on a large, sharp, sharp uh, piece of ceramic. Okay, it was lying in the yard. 
<clears throat> John apparent, appears furtively around servants' quarter, haltingly and deferentially or brazenly enters foyard to face Magdalene. How do you want to say this line, Rob? <laughs> Mistress? <laughs> yeah. Mistress? <laughs> Anybody else want to take a weird? These are not thespians up here. Okay. <laughs> Frankly, I'm not. I'm not either. I am not an actor, never hoped to be, not a director or anything else. I never had any plans to get into theater. I got into writing a couple of historical plays because the development director at a historic site I was working at asked me to. Thought it would be a good way to raise some money. So I said, you yeah, know, I'm a consultant by trade. So I said, yeah, what the hell, why not? <laughs> I got a clipboard, I got a pen. What else do you need? So in writing this thing, look at this. It appears furtively around servant's quarter. Everything in italics is uh, basically stage direction. Haltingly and deferentially or brazenly. So here we already have a choice to make. What is this character going to be like? Is he going to be like you know some kid on the streets of uh, uh, East Side of Manhattan, or is he going to be, which is probably more typical for Maryland right on through the 18th century, and for African American Marylanders right up until probably 1970s, a more deferential, you know, you know, heavy way of resisting, but could be very deferential, and that affects how this line is going to be said. It could be uh, mistress, or it could be. Mistress, you know, it could be like, we want, you're in my face kind of thing. I mean, you, you could play with that. But when you make that choice, that's going to affect the rest of what you write because you're developing the characters you go along. That has value for when you're going to state, when you develop a full play, you're going to stage it. And it has value for when you start trying to understand the interpersonal dynamics that operate into this world that we've defined archaeologically. You know, we know have a footprint of the building. We have sense of where the trash pits are, privy, and that sort of thing. So the question is, where do you go from here? Who says the next line, and what is that line? I'm done. <laughs> it's in your hands. Who's going to say the next line? I mean, you can throw anything out here, but just keep in mind the question. What we're interested in are those two apparently different forms of trash disposal. Why are there two, two ways of throwing out the trash? And so this is going to develop along those lines. So what would be a natural next, what would be the next line? You lazy brat. Okay. I would have said bastard, but. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay, so we can, I could type these things out, but I'm such a terrible typer. So <laughs> let's just make believe I'm typing it. Mentally type it in your head. Uh, so the next line is Magdalene. You lazy bastard. Next line? It wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what her next line would be? You're our servant, not our son. <laughs> right? And you can do that. You can play with that. And actually, if you are doing this for an audience, it helps to make it a little more contemporary so it's something people can. So you can throw some humor in there. And you can try not to damage the microphone. Uh, you, you can play with that. Uh, but for our purposes, we don't want to get too far afield. We don't want to turn this into a 100-page play. Which, by the way, if you read published plays, that's what they are. They're about 100 pages long, and most of it's white space. So you may not be able to write a novel in a month, but a play? <laughs> Very excellent plays have been written in, in far less time. Uh, there are not a lot of words. And notice, too, the way this is developing. We haven't gotten to a full sentence yet. We're ready to go on to page two here. We don't have a full sentence yet. Uh, oh, this is how people actually speak today, and my guess is it's how they often spoke then. I'm a native New Yorker. My lines often have a line starts and then dot, 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 which indicates that the next person is talking over them. New Yorkers are very good at that. It's amazing we understand what one another is saying. We probably don't. But uh, this overlapping dialogue it makes it more natural, too. We're looking for a degree of naturalism here. <clears throat> so OK, you lazy bastard. And, and, and what would be the, Jack's response? 
who has children, who has sons? <laughs> I think um, Generation Shrug would go, what? <laughs> okay, well, you, and you can write that. And then if you want to make this more realistic later, you can always go back and rewrite stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. For instance, we can go back, and I'll sort of cue you in on where I've gone with this. We can go back to that first stage direction. Instead of tossing maize kernels, what else could she be tossing to the yard, fell? Moisture shells. The contents of the chicken Maybe. pot. Really? <laughs> <laughs> if he's that bad a servant. See, that's why you guys have mad cow disease. You've got to stop. You've got to stop doing that. <laughs> now, what else would you feed to yard fowl? Leftovers. Leftovers. Yeah, and that you know, really leftovers back. That's just you know, crap food that you know, no one's going to eat. It's garbage. Yeah, you take that out. You throw it out to the yard fowl. So you, you clean up around the kitchen, right? And you take the stuff out, you start tossing it out to the yard fowl or, you know, pigs. The pigs in this period tend to just kind of roam free, free through the woods and, and fend for themselves. But yeah, so she's throwing this stuff out. She's yelling at him because there's a big ass shirt sitting in the middle of the foreyard that didn't belong there. Can you see where I'm going with the different approaches to throwing out trash? The big shirt should have been with any other, you know, big pieces of oyster shell, bone, stuff like that, should have been carted by Jack, the indentured servant, out to the borrow, empty borrow pit. You know, the, they dig this hole, they get the soil out of it, they, you know, mush it up, turn it into plaster, and they plaster their waddle and dog chimney with it. So once you've done that, you end up with a, with a big hole, and what the hell, it's throwing the trash in it, right? So that's the method of throwing out rubbish as opposed to this other approach, this other activity that's going on, which is throwing out leavings, food refuse. That happens to include bits of pipe stem and other small bits of ceramic. So she's doing one form of trash disposal, a certain kind of trash for a certain purpose. Jack was supposed to be doing another type for another purpose. Now, we could leave it there, or we can go ahead and test this. Can we, let me make this thing back up. Come on, there we go. Can we look at this, these so-called surface middens, and determine whether or not they are really people throwing out rubbish, or are they throwing out the little stuff, the food leavings and whatnot, for the yard fowl? All of us in this room can come up with test implications and test it. Basically, that's all I was looking for. Now, some of the issues, for instance, going back to poor tobacco with the uh, sedimentation, you know, that's a higher level of problem. This is a fairly simple one that I might have been able to figure out without going through the exercise of writing a play. But you can see how this can be done and quite simply. And the object is not to be a Pulitzer Prize winner. Although, if you earn one of those, that's pretty nice, too. Um, the prize money is probably more than most of us get in a year at a regular job, so it's worth getting. Uh, but the two purposes I see are as a research tool and also as an education tool. So that's pretty much all I have to say. Thank you.